The Great War would suddenly catapult the light machine gun into a battlefield necessity. With few nations adopting any before the conflict, shortages would be severe. The previously slow-selling Madsons became a golden prize for anyone who could get them. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is still the Madsen 1905 light machine gun. Uh, yeah, we're having two episodes on the exact same gun, but let's go ahead and have a quick refresher on those stats. This particular example has an overall length of 44 inches and weighs in at 26.5 pounds. It has a magazine capacity of 25 rounds. It's in a single stack detachable form, fed from the top, and it chambers the 7 by 57 millimeter cartridge. However, you could get it in just about anything. All right, gang, we've seen the Madsen Rasmussen recoil rifle developed all the way up until 1905, which gave us our gun here today. And in addition, we actually saw some pieces that would be tacked on the Danish 1903 flat top version. Uh, you're going to see like the underside support hand grip, the telescoping bipod, and the rear stocks monopod that sort of breaks that up. Those would all also be added to this gun at various points in the timeline. For this episode, we are going to investigate just who used these guns in all their configurations in World War I. But first, let's look at what the Danish set out to do with their guns, because they're, they're the leaders on this. How were they using them? Well. Each recoil rifle had one gunner and two carriers. Each group of three guns had a section leader and an ammunition horse, which packed in 1,920 rounds. Add in the magazines carried by the soldiers and you get 2,880 rounds per section. Now, in time, we'll see most of Scandinavia adopting these guys in some form, but they were all neutral during the first big brawl, so we're not going to be ready to discuss them in detail here today. Hopefully we get to revisit the improved versions of this gun another time for other conflicts. Instead, I'm going to be talking about the participating powers of the Great War. And first among them for this gun is actually going to be Russia they were actually the largest purchaser of the Danish recoil rifle long before 1914. That's because they contracted for the Madsen as an emergency measure during their 1904 war with Japan. Being caught off guard by a surprisingly modern and effective Japanese military, Russian ordnance would reach out to the recoil rifle syndicate. While they had heavy Maxim machine guns to field, they found their cavalry firepower wanting and were looking for the most mobile option they could find. The gun they chose was the model 1903 cavalry pattern, although with mounting trunnions attached, that way the gun could be used by either Russian horsemen or fortifications. Confusingly, these would be known as the model 1902 in Russia, despite their later adoption. Apparently roughly 200 of these were completed before trouble hit. You see, the syndicate was still having the guns manufactured at the Danish state arsenal. This arrangement had actually been profitable for the government over the past few years. It enabled them to sustain a research and development program, pay uh, and employ talented gunsmiths as, as you know, over across their dry seasons, and even pocket some cash for their own rearmament programs. But now it was getting complicated. In Denmark, the nation, well, they're making firearms for Russia who is presently at war. Well, that's going to upset a lot of people and become a risk to this sense of Danish neutrality. The issue came to public thanks to a handful of newspaper and magazine articles and caused pretty big uproar. So the Danish government intervened. They demanded a halt to any arms production for Russian contracts and probed the then Minister of War, Wilhelm Madsen. Well, what the heck's going on, man? Well, Madsen explained from the government side, the contract was as usual. Guns were being made for the syndicate. And the syndicate, well, they brought out their own contracts and paperwork, which showed that the buyer was actually a German businessman. Yep, just your usual German businessman buying up hundreds of machine guns in 762 while Russia is at war. Nothing going on there. So <laughs> the Danish government 
went after the German buyer who they thought about making him sign contracts and blah, blah, blah. But in the end, they basically have him pinky swear that he's not going to sell to Russia, but also noted that they had no real way of punishing him if he did sell to Russia. However, the fact that they couldn't punish him meant that th that matters on Germany's head. Germany is at fault if they get sold to Russia. So with that in mind, they authorized production up to 6,000 guns. That decision may also have been influenced by the course of the Russo-Japanese War. It's likely the ban on sales to Russia at war was due to British interests, and by the summer of 1905, when the guns were finally permitted to be sold, Russia was losing so badly that international opinion had kind of swung the other way. People were now nervous that Japan was going to take too much. By the way, all of this mess uh, would prompt the Danish Recoil Rifle Syndicate to open their own factory for manufacture in 1906, which, as we will see, kinda helped the problem. Anyway, total sales to Russia appears to be roughly 1,300 recoil rifles, though most arrived after the war ended. It's estimated that 250 were available in time for the fight. We know that 210 were issued among 35 cavalry teams. The remainder were left at a state rifle school for further training and evaluation, in addition to acting as a reserve. It's also interesting to note that each gun was sold with a spare barreled action. This was likely just an expedient field maintenance issue, but it's curious to consider it may have been used as a hot swap. Now, Russia would be the only World War I belligerent to adopt the recoil rifle in large numbers before the Great War, and even once things started, they still seemed to have had the most of any nation. So how did they use them? Well, almost exclusively for cavalry, and a lot like the Danish did, until at least 1911. The machine gunner would keep the rifle on his horse, 16 magazines came along with, which fit into one bag. 12 more bags were carried with the gun, so 5,200 rounds, so a little bit more ammo there. I suspect either a cart or pack animal was used for transport because in combat, each recoil rifle was crewed by just three men. A gunner and two carriers. These teams were fielded in pairs overseen by a single NCO. Now, Russian experience with the recoil rifle was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, German observers did note at least one early success in the Battle of Nanschen, however. Uh, on June 8th, 1905, a large Japanese flanking attack was successfully halted by just four of these recoil rifles. Initially, their infantry had closed to within 300 meters of the Russians' forces before the largely spread out and thoroughly concealed Madsen teams opened fire. After the Japanese realized they could not break the line as it was, they recalled their riflemen a little further back and began a series of light artillery strikes attempting to break up the Russian defenders. But because they were mostly facing just four guns and not an entire line of opposing infantry, the effect was nearly nothing. You're playing a game of battleship. The returning infantry were again cut down by machine gun fire, and so they had to retreat. Despite that excellent battlefield report, on the whole, the recoil rifle was proving a bit complicated for Russia. The guns required special training, suffered parts breakages over time, and generally required more attention than your average rifle. Which in fairness to the gun is to be expected, but Russia wanted to streamline and standardize and they had decided on the Maxim as their one true machine gun. Instead of training some troops on one system or the other or both and trying to source extra parts for the Madsons, in 1911 they decided it would be better to recall them all from field duty and putting them into either storage or fortifications defense where they would be subject to far less abuse and wear and eat up fewer parts. All right, so that's Russia down, at least pre-war. Who's next to use this particular gun? Well, in June of 1904, again, the Recoil Rifle Syndicate sold the patent rights for the Madsen Rasmussen to a British businessman, Henry de Morgan Snell. Under the terms of this contract, Snell would have the right to market, produce, and sell the Recoil Rifle and actually two other guns that were available to the DRS, the Kvist rifle and the Scobo pistol, uh, he would be able to sell them to the British Empire. But nowhere else. Nowhere but the British Empire. This was probably a good investment for the rifle syndicate because until the end of 1904, only 11 guns had been sold 
worldwide outside the Russia situation. It's a big oof. Schnell bought a handful of 1903 pattern guns and marketed them as the Scoble machine gun, further adding to the confusion about the rifle's inventors. This was all marketed under the Rexer Arms Company Limited, and eventually he would start calling the recoil rifle the Rexer Automatic Machine Gun. Snell established a British production factory for the gun, but given how expensive that tool up would be, some of the trickier bits were purchased back again from the Danish Army Arsenal just until he could get some sales going, I'm sure. Uh, Rexer would chamber their guns for 303 primarily and submit them to British trials. The only real penetration they got was with the Australian Light Horse, and some were sent over to India, and a few seemed to have turned up in various parts of the empire, as you can see here. A handful seemed to have remained in inventory, likely primarily used for aviation, though again, like you saw, some photos do turn up. Now, some of the reason that Snell didn't fully penetrate the British market is probably because he was forced out of it before he had a number of years to work. You see, he kind of got ahead of himself and started marketing to South America and China and Japan. This was outside his agreement with the syndicate, and so they would sue him in London. The matter went to court in April of 1907, and the syndicate's punitive demand for 90,000 pounds was upheld. Snell and Rexer were bankrupted. The Rexer uh, machinery and tooling therefore became the property of the syndicate, which brought it all home to Denmark, helpfully upgrading their own fledgling factory. Okay, so we got Russia, we got Britain, how about France? Well, they trialed the recoil rifle way back in November of 1907. This photo is obviously from much later. The guns were chambered in 8mm Lebel. Boy, can you really tell that from that magazine, can't you? While the French were somewhat impressed, they seemed to remain non-committal. Some must have been purchased, though, as French Aviation Inventory reports 30 on hand at the end of 1916. So now we have a good many in Russia, a handful in the... United Kingdom spread around, and a couple in France. Not much to talk about yet, is it? Well, luckily for all of you, I have a lot more to say about the Germans. But first, let's take a little break and let May try out that weird seated position. We need a firing segment here, right? Before I start talking about the Madsen as used by the Central Powers, I want you to understand it has been a really messy piece of research. I've been hoarding data for a few years, and in trying to string it together, it's still pretty patchy. Now, part of the reason for this is because most of these stories about the Madsen's use in the war, they each come from their own country's researchers. So a Russian book talking about the Russian Madsen's or a German memoir talking about German use of the Madsen, sort of. Uh, I honestly believe the keystone of this whole mess is still missing, and even then, it would take a good year of working primarily on this topic in order to prove it all out. This would be a really good place for someone to really sort out a good book and clean up some of the stories I'm going to tell you. Uh, there may even be some inaccuracies here. I just want you to be aware, this is what we know so far. 
First, let's go with Bulgaria. In January of 1915, they were still a neutral power and were so able to contact the syndicate and purchase 660 recoil rifles. Now, supposedly these were in 7 by 57 millimeters, same as this gun right here, but let's look at the curvature of that magazine. Yeah, that's a rimmed cartridge, probably 8x50 Austrian. If the ordered guns were in 7x57, then that gun and others I have seen are either conversions from that cartridge or some entirely different contract. Anyway, the 7x57 guns were apparently made for Brazil, but then sent back for repairs and updates, and then as Brazil often did, they decided Nah, and tried to sell them. So Bulgaria snapped them up, but they wanted them shipped by rail through Germany. And yeah, Denmark isn't having that. So they were sent by sea, but the Entente stopped the merchant ship. Through negotiations, the cargo was then moved over to a Swedish steamer on the promise that they go straight to the port of Dedegach. But that didn't happen. Instead, the Swedish captain and Bulgarian advisor headed for the Kaiser Wilhelm Canal, where they were stopped by the Germans this time. From here, the Swedish captain insists he was betrayed by the Germans, but it's a bit of a he said, she said, and honestly, I don't know how honest he is to begin with, who knows. Uh, it's most likely that the Swedish ship unloaded at Lübeck and forwarded the guns by rail again across Germany. Denmark got pretty mad about this, but Germany super promised they didn't want them anyway because they were in 7mm and Germany doesn't use that cartridge. Which has actually been true on our shows so far. What actually happened to them though, I don't know for sure, but I have a semi-educated series of guesses. Only one power in World War I was officially running 7x57mm and that was Serbia but obviously neither Bulgaria or Germany were going to give them any of these guns. But Serbian rifles and consequently their ammunition were widely available in two, well, later central powers. Bulgaria, thanks to previous conflicts with Serbia, likely had rifles and ammunition in 7mm. They were also the buyer of the guns and may well have just received them. We just haven't found photos because of how few, or they did find some way to convert them. Alternatively, Austria had manufactured both rifles and ammo for Serbia and many South American countries in 7x57. As we saw in our Chilean Mauser episode, Austria-Hungary would make use of a good number of 7mm guns, leaving them in their original chambering even. Germany, however, never fielded 7mm guns, to my knowledge. They did, however, seize production of some. We saw this in our Mauser 1910 episode where some 6.8x57 and 7x57mm rifles were easily converted to 7.92x57. How simple that is to do to a Madsen? Uh, it's been debated a bit. And sadly, I've not laid hands on any of the known German used guns. Uh, they should be in 7.92x57. I checked uh, with my friends at the Springfield Armory National Historic Site and they say, yeah, it's in 7.92. German techs also report guns in 7.92 and I'm sure they were in that chambering, but if they were made that way as part of a secret contract or somehow converted from 7x57 guns, I can't be sure. Photo evidence tells me the majority of Central Power Madsons were in the 1905 pattern like ours today, just with the support grip and sometimes the monopod. So probably later production. Their magazines match the one that we have here, so very likely 7x57 or 7.92x57, but definitely not a rimmed cartridge like 8x50 Austrian. Now if Germany didn't swipe those 660 recoil rifles, well, where did Germany get their guns? The short answer is from just about everywhere they could. The Lewis gun and other light machine guns were proving to be a bother, and Germany didn't have anything on hand in significant numbers to deal with the situation. In early 1915, they would start pushing heavily for their intelligence network to get any and all light automatics they could reasonably field. Since this activity was largely done in secret and ad hoc, that makes my job pretty hard. However, we do have some autobiographical data from a famous spy and saboteur, Captain Franz von Rittelen. 
Now he was working with German naval intelligence at the time, a man made famous for his sabotage operations in the United States. Rintelen had posed as a US businessman and established a fake ammunition company so he could buy US gunpowder and just destroy it. He also made a failed bid to purchase the DuPont Powder Company. He worked with a chemist to develop time-delayed incendiary pencil bombs and would use irate Irish dock workers to smuggle them into British merchant shipping. The fires would force the British crew into tossing their munitions overboard at sea. Rintelen also organized the Labor's National Peace Council in order to promote strike activity in the US, further slowing US production for the war. His agent in this respect was David Lamar, the Wolf of Wall Street. I'm going to be honest, Rintelen may be one of the most interesting men in history. His own autobiography of his work in World War I was written in the 1930s and is titled The Dark Invader. Give it a read sometime. But before any of those exploits, he was put in charge of getting some machine guns for the German Naval Corps, a group of Navy-turned infantrymen sent to Flanders. In his own words, the then Lieutenant Rintelen says, We received orders to provide the Corps with machine guns, and we were told that it did not matter how we got them or where we got them from, that we had to procure them even if we had to fetch them from the moon. So his target became roughly 300 light machine guns in storage with the Danish Recoil Rifle Syndicate. Now these particular guns, I am told, had already been purchased by Russia, but German and Austrian agents were watching them, and every time the Russians tried to pick them up, diplomatic phones started ringing about neutrality, and the Danish government came running in and shut it down. So German agents paid for the guns again, which I'm sure the syndicate was happy with, paid twice for guns they didn't have to deliver. And from there, it became a game of capture the flag. German, Austrian, French, Russian agents all keeping an eye on that prize, waiting for an opening to not technically steal, but to smuggle it to their side without the other finding out. Rintelen had a plan though. He disguised himself as a British businessman and headed for Copenhagen, taking along a Prussian Lance Corporal who had spent years in Denmark before the war. There he made contact with the Russian agents, telling them that he was with the, the British government and was an agent attempting to help them smuggle out the guns. Rintelen acquired a Swedish merchant ship and had it disguised as a Russian vessel. He told the Russians he had bribed the German agents and arranged to have them distracted and drunk on the Kaiser's birthday. On that night, they would help him quickly load the Madsons onto the Russian ship and be on their way. There was only one problem. At the last meeting before the caper, his Lance Corporal had had a bit too much to drink and suddenly bowed, clicked his heels together, and in perfect German yelled, May I offer Mr. Lieutenant a cigar? Yep, the Russians weren't as drunk as the Prussians. They knew to quietly leave the room and never come back. So that scheme had failed, and Rintelen had to retreat back to Germany. For a couple of weeks anyway. Then he came back and did the exact same plan, but to the French agents, who thankfully fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Yep, the poor Frenchman happily helped him load up, amazed that he had managed to break the German guards. And they sent him on his way back home with a few hundred recoil rifles for Germany. So what did Germany do with their Madsons, by the way? Well, first and foremost, they renamed them. Again, most German Madsons were probably in 792, and I'm not certain you can easily convert a 7mm to the cartridge, especially with how fiddly and not at all modular the original Madsons were. Uh, it would be a few more decades before we see a quick change standardized model being made. Uh, I've seen sources claim up to 5,000 recoil rifles were purchased by Germany, but that number seems really high to me. However, they may have very well managed to also additionally, on top of this caper, have some personally tailor-made and delivered. In a nod to keeping Denmark from facing violations in neutrality, they took measures to disguise the origin of these guns, regardless of how they got them. It's easy to spot a German or Austrian Madsen. They have the Dance Recoil Rifle Syndicate markings ground off, and apparently some were overstamped with German arsenal markings, further confusing the issue. In period documentation, German officials clarify the Madsons should never be called Madsons, or Danish even. They are Musket, and in period manuals, they are called as such and noted to be very much like the Danish Madsen. 
but not the Danish medicine. It's the Danish medicine. This has led a lot of authors to believe that Germany produced their own copy of the recoil rifle. However, I have seen no evidence of this, and plenty that they have just been obscuring their source. Now, in terms of actual utility, both Germany and Austria-Hungary would field these guns on the front line, mostly making up for the lack of light machine guns from their own inventories. For Germany, the Musket Battalion were assembled in 1915. 500 men in three companies. Each company had 30 automatic rifles, four officers, and 160 or so men of other ranks. When deployed, each gun was worked by four men. I suspect Austria-Hungary used a similar system, however, I have not found clear documentation. In terms of how they were fielded, however, the Kaiser and the Habsburgs appear to have differed. References to Alpine officers and experienced ski troops seem to be flushed out in period photos of Austrian Madsen troops. I almost always find these guns in the mountains. Given the lack of true light machine guns for Austria during the war, I expect they remained relevant through 1918. In Germany, I've heard the Ulan forces also received Madsons, though I've been unable to confirm that. But what we do know is the Musket Battalion was first identified by the Entente in September of 1915 at the Second Battle of Champagne. They were also spotted at the Somme. Most people might expect the Madsen to be an assault weapon in World War I, but it seems that limited parts availability, the complexity of the mechanism, and the effect of sustained wear and its susceptibility to mud place it more of a second line or reserve position in that time. So the Musket Battalion were used as a defensive measure, highly mobile. They could be fielded at potential enemy breakthroughs, providing sudden overwhelming defensive firepower in order to halt an advance. They could also hold these damaged sectors, even in the face of artillery bombardment, due again to their small size and you know, wide mobility. Unfortunately, this was not an effective use of manpower, and again, the guns were hard to keep in service. So when the standardized MG0815 became available, the Madsons were largely phased out. Germany's remaining guns likely went to Austria, although I've heard stories of them going to Rommel's forces in Romania for use on cars, where they would get less dirty because they're not on the ground. Now, that is all I know for Madsen combat use by the Central Powers. But there is one more big story about this particular gun coming out of World War I, and for that we have to go back over to Russia who obviously, under the pressure of war shortages, refielded their guns, usually again with cavalry, as they had done before 1911. But by World War I, maybe a little over a thousand were still serviceable, and those that were, well, they sent them over to Tula and Sestresk and you know, had them repaired and updated to modern Spitzer ammunition. Even with these, the shortage was acute. Uh, Russian Chief of Staff, General Mikhail Belyev, had a direct quote on the matter. The number of machine guns in the infantry is not enough, but the cavalry, insignificant. Given what we know about Russian arms shortages, that's real bad. So they would try to purchase light machine guns abroad. While this generally worked out for rifles and even heavy machine guns, light machine guns, well, they were the new hot ticket. No one had properly prepared for this before the war, so all production was already spoken for. As we already covered, they did try to buy from the syndicate in Denmark, but that was blocked by politics. And then the Germans ran off with them, apparently. So a new plan was formed. A joint stock company was started in Petrograd. The goal was to establish a factory in Kovrov, which officially began in November of 1916. The goal was a production total of 600 to 800 recoil rifles a month in order to fill a contract with the newly formed company for 15,000 in total. These were to be a special model, the P1916, which to my understanding was a 1905 setup in 762 with the assisting grip and rear monopod. Remember, until now, they were using the flat-topped 1903 pattern, which had none of the simplifications or upgrades of the later export guns like the one we've shot. Each gun was to cost 1,733 rubles and 30 kopecks, a considerable sum, but once the 15,000 unit order was fulfilled, the factory would become property of the Russian government. 
Danish engineers, tooling, and equipment were put to work setting up the facility, with Russian gunsmiths and other technical support only coming later on and serving in more minor roles at first, like the rather basic job given to a young Sergei Simonov at the facility in April of 1917. The goal was to have three main buildings ready by February of 1917, but that never happened. Instead, wartime competition for resources and personnel and political upheaval stalled construction of the primary factory building into 1918. Ultimately, the Russian Civil War would doom the project. No additional Madsons would be made for Russia during the war. Reports say the Danish engineers didn't just abandon the facility, but actively resorted to sabotaging it at this point. However, have not been able to trace the source of that claim. What we do know is that the nearly finished plant was saved thanks to the Russian gunsmith Vladimir Fedorov. We will hopefully see this man again someday in our work. I hope. He was assisted by Vasily Degteliev, who would eventually rise to such prominence that the Kovrov machine gun factory would be renamed after him in 1949. Again, no real gun deliveries from this plant during the war, but I thought that it was worth mentioning right now in this sort of Madsen origin, because I'm sure we're going to see those names in that factory again. Following the Great War, none of our belligerent powers took the Madsen seriously, and it quickly fell from most inventories. That doesn't mean it was done for, though, as export sales for the Syndicate would last decades. Uh, though mostly we're going to see things like Portugal, South America. The gun was still being improved in the 1950s, and even today we actually see them in the hands of Brazilian police. So 116 years or so of service thus far. That's not a bad legacy for our inventors. Now, Wilhelm Madsen might have lost his minister's position, but he did stay involved in politics, even serving in the parliament. He was active in the budget debates for the Danish Armed Forces until his retirement from the army in 1914, having achieved the rank of Major General. He continued his mathematics works and served with the Graduate Survey, and continued to be a member of the Copenhagen Shooting Association, all until his death until 1917. Julius Rasmussen changed his last name to Bjarnov around 1900. I have no idea why. When he reached the age of 70, he was forced to retire from his government job, but still stayed involved in arms design. For his efforts, he received the Knight's Cross, among various other honors. He passed away in July of 1912. <laughs> okay, that's two long episodes for sure, but now we can finally settle back and talk about using this gun, the actual experience of shooting it. And for that, we're going to need May's opinion. All right, gang, we've made room for May, and we have just enough space on the desktop for the Madsen. Don't think we're going to be handing that back and forth like we usually do, but I still think you could probably take us through a tour of its ergonomics. Uh, what's it like to handle this gun? Because this is pretty wild looking. So, granted, we have handled this gun for Project Lightning, so this wasn't my first experience. Unlike the normal stuff for this series, this wasn't my first experience handling this gun, so I... I did have a little bit of an understanding of it, but it was nice to have a second shot at it. Pun intended. Oh, God. <laughs> Come on, we gotta leave that stuff in. It's good for the viewers. We're supposed to be professionals. We are professionals. That was a professional pun. You don't want my unprofessional puns. They're not nice. Okay, so back to the gun. <laughs> What's it like handling it? So, essentially, what I have here, it looks and almost feels like a rifle. I mean, I've got this, what feels like a nice uh, a barrel sticking out. Like I've got what feels like an average rifle stock. Like Maybe like a little bit low. It's a little bit low, don't get me wrong, but nothing about those two things I'm unfamiliar with in just a general idea of it. But on top of that, they're both not that weird in terms of looks. Like they both, they both feel rifle-like, right? Yeah, it's like, okay, I got a jacketed barrel. Yeah. I got a bipod. Right. And then I've got this shoulder stock that looks high combed, a little bit of a low bow. Yeah. In the shotgun world, this would be sort of an older style, but it's still... 
Which we haven't really yeah. done a lot of that. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, you're right. There's nothing that's that off about it. It's just a little bit unusual for the rifle world. Yeah, I think they call it swan neck. Now that my mind is clicking. Is that what it's clicking. called? A swan yeah, neck? Swan neck. I could kind of see that. The swoop to it. Yeah. Swanny. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but why, what's going on in the middle in between those two things? Yeah, so it's this weird bulky section that doesn't really make a lot of sense for everything else because it feels like most of the weight's almost there too. Like it feels like a lot of the weight is in the center right there and to the rear technically right. so it's 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 an odd place for it and don't get me wrong this is still something I could feel comfortable shouldering like I didn't really have any issues maneuvering with it either um, but it is a bit unusual it's not quite it's not quite in the grounds that we've had for some of the machine guns. Like it doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit into the yeah. same categories that they So did. similar light machine guns to this one. Lewis. Sort of. It's kind of like it sits in between the Lewis and the BAR. The yeah, BAR, you pick that thing up, and it's just, oh, it's a very large rifle. That was the most rifle-like light machine gun I have had. Yeah, you pick it up, and you're like, is this like a rifle for people with really big hands? You yeah, know? basically. And then you go to the Lewis gun, and that's clearly a light machine gun. Well, Every, it's got that big pan sitting on top of it. Like, but, everything about that. But regardless of that, the jacket and the way the oh, weight's yeah. distributed... When I've, every every adult male I've handed the Lewis gun to has done the same thing. They hold it up, and they heft it, and they go, oh. And then they do this, and they try to shoulder it, <laughs> and they, they kind of can, but they kind of start pitching forward, and they go, I don't think I can actually shoot it that way. Right. You can get it up, but unless you're like a big old dude, it's, it's not hard. easy to keep yeah. it up. Right. This, you interestingly... Yeah, oh yeah, you could get this up and put it on your shoulder. Even I could, and I'm not as strong as the average man, I would argue. But there's something that stops you, because I never see anybody try to shoulder this one. You know, honestly, I think, and I want to say it's probably because of twofold. I want to say the bipod one, because it's this isn't really like a bipod that holds itself up. Like, there's no clip or anything that holds it in place. I Is think there? there should be. There should be. I think this gun may be missing that component. Oh, okay, okay. That would <clears throat> I don't more really sense. see signs of where one was. But I see photos of these things, and they usually have a clip-style bipod. And if you think about it, if you were to fold that bipod up and clip those legs together, then they would stay there oh, yeah, they and would not be fine. fall. Yeah, they'd be all right. So As it is, they're really a pain in the butt. If there is a clip missing, sure, I could I could take that out of the equation. But I would say that's part of the equation why a lot of the guys that we handed this to didn't want to shoulder it. I'd say the other part is this weird mass in the center that's got all this stuff sticking out the side. Like, it just, it doesn't really have, we'll get more into the shooting for how that affects your vision, but it's just, it feels like it's got this heart in the center, and then all these weird little Lego pieces clipped on the side that probably affect it. They're like, oh, we're going to need to work the action. Let's slam on this this charging hand on the side. Oh, we're going to need to have uh, a mag put in this thing. Well, let's just put it on the side. Like, it feels like they just went to the extreme, just put everything on the side yeah, of this looks, gun. It looks a little retro future. Like, it's got a bunch of stuff sticking off of it. and all, There's, like, a, a charging thing and a knob and a, a spinny doodle for takedown and another spinny knob. Spinny doodle. The most technical terms for seeing Arsenal boys and girls. There's a lot of stuff hanging off this. Though. There is. It's it's quite unusual for ergonomics. And then on top of that, we're looking at the ejection port being underneath it. That's kind of weird. And then it feeds the magazine from the top. What is this? It also just feels like there's a lot of weird pieces to this guy. Yeah. And on the ejection port front, too, there's a cover for the ejection port that opens up when you rack the action. Mm -hmm. And then even though everybody's seen that, like everybody that tried this gun out that, that got to handle it at all, they would see that happen, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, ejection port. I know where you're going with this. Right. And then they put their hand. I did the same thing. Right on the ejection yeah, port. Yeah, you'd put your hand. And interestingly enough, if you put your hand far enough forward, you the ma the rounds will clear underneath. You won't touch them, but, man, you make the mistake of pulling too far back into it, and it's just not going to be a good time for Most you. people hook it with two fingers, and then they end up cupping the underside of their hand yep. and dropping hot cases right in their hand. Yep. It's not a good idea. Which Don't I think recommend. is why not on this particular gun, but on the other ones, they often had that cross support where it was very the clear stock. Yes. that you're supposed to tuck the other arm. That is one of my biggest issues with the stock on this one is that it doesn't provide that support. So you can even see me in the video where I'm kind of like for a split second guessing where to put my hand because it's not a natural place where your left hand falls under the stock for support. So you're just kind of, you put it where it fits. And I would have actually appreciated that support, but that does again come later on. Right. Um, and speaking onto the stock, I did want to make sure I mentioned 
uh, it's not really a clip on the back of that. What do we want to effectively call it? It's like it? a brace. It's like yeah. an over shoulder bracing, like hanger, whatever you want. Yeah, to call a brace. It. It's a the hanger. shoulder thing that goes up. Basically, it just flips up and lets it rest the gun on your shoulder. And for me, when I'm when I'm getting seated down into there and I'm I've gotten behind the gun, it's at an okay height for me, and it does indeed just kind of I can just let it sit there, which is fine, but. I think for you, or for even someone even taller than me, it becomes an awkward so placement thing. anybody that's as thick up top as I am, that thing stays folded the whole time. Right. And the other, the other odd thing about it is, it really is only helpful for shooting down. Which mm -hmm. might go back to the fact that this was a fortress gun in its heyday, although this one's not set up to be mounted right. in that kind of way. But I suspect that's where the origins come from, is the ability to shoot horizontally or downwards. Mm -hmm. Which is also where we probably got the expandable Extended. bipod and things like that. Uh, which is good, because what it means is they're thinking about... With, this doesn't have the monopod either, but mm -hmm. if you think about the expandable bipod and the monopod, you're getting this area of being able to pitch the gun forward or back to get much better range of high and low shooting. That's actually pretty critical and it's very forward thinking. We don't see that on a lot of other guns right. that we've seen in this series. And you are correct in which it's a situational thing because for us, when we were just basically flat terrain, I'm mostly laying prone, and then I did that weird turtle position. We were just trying to try out those extended bipod. There really wasn't a situation that we were in that they just felt right extended or that 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 brace really felt like it was necessary, you know? So I kind of am a little bit sad we didn't really have a chance to go into an environment to test them where they would have worked out best. But hey, you know, it's what we got to deal with Flatland here in well, Charleston. <laughs> you know, we heard that on the show shot because they had an overly tall bipod. Mm -hmm. Everybody felt that the show shot set too tall Which, for horizontal firing. I We all agree that is something that was incredibly difficult to it, just getting up and over to see the, down the sights. That right. was the biggest issue combined with that height of the bipod. I didn't feel that problem here. Right. I did not either. When it However, was However, if I had pushed it, it. if we had needed that extra height, we have it. We have two positions to select from on this bipod. So mm -hmm. we can make it overly tall yep. and get that advantage. And then honestly, uh, speaking of the comparison between the show shot bipod and this one, I, I really actually did like this bipod because you think about it and it, it looks kind of fragile. It doesn't really look like it's got rigidity to it just because I, I want to say whenever a bipod has independently moving legs and especially when they're as thin as these, I don't think they're really going to hold up because my experience with the show shot told me otherwise. They didn't really seat very well. They honestly got bent at one point. Like it was, it, it left me with a bad taste in my mouth. So right. when I went over to the Madsen, this one was actually great because it's got really long prongs at the bottom that seat well into the dirt. And here with the humidity that we have, the soil is just always wet. So they really needed to stick in deep. So not only are the prongs well set, it's got these nice little flaps down here at the bottom that you can turn out to create more surface area to kind of help effectively create like just a shelf there so that it doesn't it's press. Overly it. sink. Right, it doesn't overly sink at all, which is fantastic for any kind of terrain you might be in. Yeah, it's set down pretty well in soft and hard conditions. I, I appreciated it. I did not like it on concrete. Nope. Like Didn't perfectly you, smooth. Uh, slide a little? Well, we've learned that about every light machine gun. <laughs> Let me tell you, if you're going to go quick test a light machine gun in an indoor range, bring an extra pair of sneakers because that's been the easiest thing to do or flip flops because we'll just stick them down in the bottom of a shoe each and put them down on that concrete so they have something to hold traction mm -hmm. because otherwise that thing just skitters right back on you. But so far in the light machine gun series that we did before with the uh, Project Lightning, we said that we really liked the Lewis Gun's short. Bipod. Yes. I think the the Madsen specifically does a very good job of using a longer a longer bipod, which does get in the way a bit, but it uses it well. Mm -hmm. And it again, you can't rock forward into it. It's not as good as a modern bipod, but this is easily one of the top bipods we've seen. I would agree. It allows you to gain that height that we that we couldn't necessarily get from the show shot because it was too far, and where the Lewis did fall well short. Yeah. <laughs> Although, anyway, so that, in, we, we got the bipod. Yeah. We got the stock and the shoulder thing that goes up. Should I actually talk about what's the heart of it? That <laughs> Yeah, so what's it? Th this looks really, really weird. Like, there's angles in all directions. Mm -hmm. Is it actually comfortable be, to be behind this gun? Like, what happens when you're laying down and you're snugged up into it? How does it really feel? So when I'm snugged down into it and I, I've got my position ready, 
Uh, like we mentioned before, it's just, it looks kind of bizarre being behind it because I've got this giant magazine that's just sticking up from the top off to the left hand side. The sights are off to the right and I've got this weird bulkiness like surrounding it. Like uh, this top right here, this ridge up here just kind of impedes your vision a little bit. Like there's a, there's a whole mess of things going on. And then on top of that, I can't really see everything I'm doing. So granted, I could see the charging handle, but in order to access things on the side without looking, I need to kind of feel for a second unless you automatically know where they are. But I don't know, it's a bit of a clouded vision. and It kind of feels like they just stuck Lego pieces onto the side of what was already a now, complete piece. All that's obscuring your target. Yes. But does it obscure your ability to use the gun? Because what parts of this gun are we really using? We're using the charging handle? Right, which we charge once, but then it kind of, that's, that's pretty much it. You only really need to charge it once and you can go from there. Right, and theoretically it also has a lock open. Mm -hmm. uh, I say theoretically because it engages like two out of three times for this gun. <laughs> um, specific to the Madsen, we're gonna talk about it in a minute, but it tends to have some feed issues. Uh, we're not sure if it's this gun or all of them because some of the reports seem to point out that it might have been all of them. Hmm. But, uh, so you charge this gun, if it's absolutely empty it'll lock open. At that point you can release it with a left side tab. Which I thought was pretty reasonable and usable. Like it sticks out. It's a nice little tab that's pretty prominent. You don't really misunderstand what it's for because that's, that's pretty much what it does, which I thought was great. Um, it's also really obvious when you're locked open. Yeah. You can't see it. That's the thing though. You can't see any of the mechanism in this gun. No. So you don't know what it's doing except for, by the way, certain parts are behaving. So you lock the gun open. There's no visual indicator of it except that that charging handle will actually kind of have some slack to it to the rear. Yeah, it'll still it'll, fall it forward. It can wiggle right there in place. But there's no spring tension anymore. Right. And if you keep racking at it, there's all this take up and then there's just a little bit of movement and it sort of clicks out and goes dead on you. Mm -hmm. And that tells you that you're locked open. You release the uh, the slide, or not even slide lock, the breech lock. Mm -hmm. And then you feel that arm snap back forward. The action snaps back forward you know that you've engaged everything. It's picked up, you presume it's picked up around. You That's it. it's picked up around. You a can't see round. that either. You, yeah, have to, no. you can pop the top and kind of see a little sliver of brass to see that it's loaded. But it is kind of hard to check in there. So checking for any sort of, uh, any rounds in the barrel is a bit unsettling to kind of have to do over and over again. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, uh, we'll get into That's that. a whole other thing. So, okay, so we can we can charge it. Yep, and we know how to release the breech. Um, the safety, I would argue, is pretty straightforward. Nice it's flip safety, inside. nothing you, really remarkable. You can't use your trigger trigger hand for it though. You have no, to bring I your other hand around. No, I have to use around. my left hand. That is, that is unfortunate, but I mean, it's it's there's no mistaking what it is at the very least. Yeah, it's not very clearly labeled on this particular gun either, so you have to mm -hmm. know your safety position. And I, I can bait. I love the being able to switch between uh fi between auto and semi on this gun. I yeah, think that's it's pretty easy. Almost unnecessary. You think so? Well, we'll get into that in a minute for yeah. shooting, but yeah. But basically, I did want to make sure I pointed it out in this. Yeah, your fire selector is this little hook at the back behind the trigger, mm -hmm. and again, it looks a lot like something like. A, a Russian style trigger block mm -hmm. for a safety, but it's not a trigger block safety. It's just a, a trigger depth restriction. Right, which it does its job. I mean, it never once when I was in semi did I did it ever go try to that. go full, although it takes a lot to get there. Pretty weird. Concept. <laughs> Um, and last but not least, probably I would say is the mag loading this thing. This magazine, it really tried to just not want to see like I, they slowly beat themselves up over okay, time it's two factors one the magazines do get torn up as you use them just because of the nature of all this weight and then being rocked on two tiny points and mm -hmm. it eventually tears itself mm -hmm. apart we had them slowly failing over the course of project lightning we had them failing over this and we've had to make repairs and they're just always going to need some amount of repair until we're talking to the owner about finding a way to make like a reinforced steel version of this so that he can sort of convert one mag to being a shooter mag. Right, one that he can have for fun. But discounting even that, the best of the mags, to me it felt very soft when you insert them. When you put that front toe yeah. in, you can't really, f you, you don't feel, feel a positive lock. So you're like, I guess that's right. And then when you bring it down, this spring that releases the follower, that actually distends from the magazine, mm -hmm. well it pops out and then it clicks in. 
So if it doesn't click in properly, and you can't just take it back out and try again. You've got loose rounds all right, over the place. Right, all inside this little magazine well here, essentially, that are just wiggling about. So at that point, you pretty much have to clear the gun, which, again, that's a fun thing to do in order to make it well again. Alternatively, you can fish one round out and restack the magazine and try again. If one round's sitting there, not a big deal. But it's still, it's a lot of, like, math to right. kind of keep in your mind. But yeah. uh, it's pretty tricky. Ergonomics on this gun overall, it's a weird, 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 weird rifle. And it basically just feels like an automatic rifle, essentially. That's weird to think it's a machine gun. Yeah. So let's talk about actually shooting it. What's it like once you get behind the sights? So I've already talked about the sights previously, but I really want to make sure I, I kind of set this home. When you are looking on the sights, yes, obviously very crowded. But you almost need like a spotter on your left side just because of how how blocked out your left side of your vision is. And not just the magazine, but just everything else combined. If you look at the gun, if you're looking down the sights, you can just see how the mag the mag release is blocking you. You still you've got even potentially part of the the breech release in there. Like it's it's incredible. Yeah, What's all there? Specific to the left side, you have the magazine, the magazine release both sticking up. Mm -hmm. There's a little gap that you can kind of see through in case somebody's coming, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then you have this bulge on the left side of the top cover. Right. That's there again for that single feed arm to save on the extra hinge to keep it from having to tuck under. Mm -hmm. But because they've done that, they've actually wiped out a pretty big portion of your your uh, peripheral vision. Right. Which is just, I don't know if it was worth getting it down to one piece, but that's how it went. I don't know. It's it's very unsettling to know that effectively I can't see a lot of anything that's happening on the left side of my vision. Now you have to be able to see your target and hope to God you don't have any extra ones popping up there. Now granted, that's at like 100 meter range. If you crank these sights up a little bit, it's going to pitch down and you're going to get clear you'll of that home. You'll gain a little bit of that back. You'll, but you'll you, eventually get clear of the home. But by then... You'll get clear of the mag. No, you'll never get, you'll <laughs> you'll never never get, get clear, clear of the, the mag. mag. No. <laughs> so there's a there's some busyness, especially on the left. So you really want to lead the targets as they're traveling to the right if you can help it. I don't know how you can control that based on battlefield conditions, uh. but if it, if I had this gun, I, it's like having that that blind spot, you know. Right. I would have a rifleman right over my left shoulder the entire time. Exactly. So it's a little bit uh, unsettling in that respect, but. Um, the actual, you know, looking to, from the rear sight to the front sight, that, that one little hole section, that's actually not too bad. It's it's pretty decent V-notch sight leading up to the front. Yeah, this is a tangent uh, rear leaf. It mm -hmm. looks almost identical to a, like, Norwegian Krag Jorgensen. Well, not too bad. Yeah, it's pretty close, though. Um, it's dead simple. I mean, this yeah. is this would be standard on Mauser rifles and other military rifles all through World War II. Nothing heck confusing about that, but, you know, no. just beware of your left. Pretty <laughs> Pretty clean sight line. I mean, it's fine. It's just really blocked up. Yeah, that's the only issue with that. Um, we already talked about getting prone with this guy. Pretty good height for the bipod as is for laying down. Um, yes or no, if you want to end up using uh, that that guide um, for your shoulder. Yeah, off. that over shoulder brace thing. Yeah, the brace. Uh, if you want to use it or not, go for it. Try it. Don't, don't really matter. And then pulling the trigger. So here is the thing with that trigger. It's a progressive trigger. And... Granted, I, I personally kind of like it, but it's something you have to get used to when you're trying to do full auto. For semi-auto, no problem. You can do that all day and expect your single shots. The problem comes when you go to go full auto, you need to make sure you pull all the way through in order to engage burst mode, <laughs> effectively. Yeah. I've only felt this on one other gun so far, but I'm not that experienced with modern firearms. Uh, P90. Yeah, not so I was, bad. I was very surprised. And that was after we'd shot the Madsen. I got my hands on a P90 mm -hmm. as part of some other event. And uh, it was the exact same setup. Actually, Ian's the one that handed the gun to me. And he goes, yeah, it works just like the Madsen. I went, what? And I pulled the trigger. And sure enough, like, oh I was like, God. works like the Madsen. Because yeah. what it is, is it's, it's little pull, little pull, boom. And you go, oh, that's rather a lovely trigger. Where's the rest of the booms? Yeah, you just got to keep pulling. Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> nope, you got to keep pulling. And then once you finally get down there, almost like getting through a double action revolver, like, it's weird, but imagine if you had a, a double single revolver, mm -hmm. but instead of being single action or double action, imagine if, as you started to pull it, it single action shot, mm -hmm. and then you kept pulling, and by the time it dropped the hammer for double action, it just dumped the whole cylinder. That's how this feels if you have to imagine it versus 
So I know it's really wild to think about, but that's the only way I can sort of put it into terms. That's actually that, a pretty good comparison if you want to think about it. just in terms of the weight that is behind that, I would argue. No, the to me, that gap between the, the first shot and then full auto yeah. ruins full auto. Yeah, it, that's fair. Honestly, it, it, when I was shooting, I, I almost forgot to pull through. Like, it's not like I forgot to pull through, but it just it's, it's such a disconnect. It's not a natural thing that you're doing for any of the guns we've shot so far for this series. It feels weird, and it's like, it's steady. It's a steady pull, I would argue, between semi and full, but... And there's a significant amount of pull that you have to go from semi to full, I would argue. It's too much. It's, I, it's not that, but it, it's... If anybody's used full auto, it's all about rhythm. Yes. Like, once you get the first shot off, your second and third shots aren't usually straight. Mm -hmm. But then your fourth, fifth, sixth, depending on the fire rate, they clean up. They actually get a little bit better. So it's like first shot's dead on. Then you have recoil and maybe get a little high climb on the second. Mm -hmm. You balance the gun back out and you bring it back down. So maybe two, three are high. And then the rest starts sinking, and you get the rhythm, and your body. And, and the longer of a mag you have, the slower the fire rate. The more you can get on that rhythm. You know, I like how you're saying rhythm because that's what this gun does. It breaks your rhythm every time. Well, just at the start, well, it has yeah. its own After rhythm. You get, yeah. You know. But you only have 25 rounds, right? So you you have a rhythm break at the beginning. So there's like five rounds gone right there while you're trying to get yourself sorted. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre. It is incredibly unusual feeling, and it is something that you have to get used to. I would say probably by the end of like the, what we did with you know, Project Lightning, we all got kind of used to it. But even then, I still picked this gun up, took it to the range after having the experience I had on it, and I still yeah. failed to pull through all the way yeah. on that progress, and I still fired off a single shot. Yeah, we went auto. to we went to refilm the full auto segment, and the first thing you did was just be like, all right, here we go, full auto, boom. And you looked at me, you were just like, were you really going for full auto? To be fair, we did, so not this gun, but the same idea as that progressive trigger. We did a, um, just an ad hoc, you know, friendly competition, you, me, and Ian, for groupings on the P90. Oh, yeah. And then I ended up cheating that system because these two were just like, all right, I'm going to go, because the, the game was full auto burst. Well, full auto burst is really bad because you're constantly re-engaging that first shot gap, second shot. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, well, I'm going to cheat this. So I'd go... Boom, 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 and I'd have a pause. But everybody else was just trying to pull through the first and second pull, and unless you really snatch the trigger, it's it's pretty messy. Yeah, it's it's a bit unsettling. So Sorry, I know we're hammering it. That is really the most unique feeling of this gun, I think. It's a very unique feeling, and also we haven't really experienced it on anything yet for this show. It's the first experience with that, I would argue, technically, for for the guns we've shot, oh, yeah, not no. for your P90, yeah. but yeah. Okay, uh, so definitely different. Crowded sight lines. Yep. Shouldering it and laying down with the bipod all feels like just about any other light machine gun, fairly comfortable. Right. Triggers in the bad. right spot. Sure. More comfortable than like an 0815. Technically, yeah. Well, the 0815 has a nice, uh, I would argue technically that might be a little bit easier because it's got that nice... Uh, 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 Safety on the thumb? Yeah, yeah, which honestly I thought was pretty good. Okay. Uh, this but, one I've got to use But I mean, in terms of the actual shooting, comfortable? Yeah, way, way okay. comfortable. So we're comfortable behind it. The trigger's really wild. That's driving us crazy. You have to watch where you place your left hand because you're going to want to put it where the ejection port is. <laughs> you're going to want to put it where the ejection uh, everybody port is? Want, everybody wants We already talked about that. Yeah. So you gotta you got to go with the Lewis gun hold, even though you're tall. It's weird to do a Lewis gun hold on a taller gun, but that's what you're doing. Yeah, it, it just doesn't feel quite natural with it, but go on. Right. And then... Super weird trigger. Now the system's recoiling. Okay, so we see the barrel comes back. We know the action comes all the way. It's a short recoil, and then it's flipping the breech block in there. Nothing else works that way. Mm -mm. Okay, like we've had toggle locks that go up and over. We, you know, we've had rotating. We've had all this stuff. Mm -hmm. We haven't had anything yet that's just like blah, 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 blah. So as much as the trigger weirded us out, we surely have a lot to say about how weird the recoil was, right? Yeah, I I normally would like to because it all evidence says yes it should have felt weird. I didn't really feel that weird. I don't know. I it just fe honestly felt like a lot of the mass was just coming back directly into my shoulder, almost more linearly than what I was expecting. And while there was a significant amount to the recoil, it didn't feel uncontrollable. It didn't really feel like the gun was moving a lot. That's yeah. the bizarre thing. <laughs> it is absolutely interesting. If you look at it in the high speed. If you look at how the, the targets receive, and if you look at uh, period reports for accuracy under full auto, mm -hmm. this gun has a habit above other machine guns to sort of 
walk itself up and down. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to because the breech block slamming up and down, up and down, up and down. And you're going to get some disperse, dispersion. I can't feel it. I think that I'm dead on with this thing. Mm -hmm. It feels like the Lewis gun almost in terms of being very controllable and very even keeled. I'd put it almost in once you're past the first 10 rounds on an 0815, you're in that... No, because the 0815 shakes the gun. Yeah, the I'm shakes. talking about the wrong gun. Yeah. No, it'd be like a <laughs> very totally well, it'd be like a well bedded BAR. It yes. feels if, one that's like actually like seated down with yeah. everything with like the bipod attachment. Yeah, later on. something like that. But it feels good. However, you go look at the target and you're like, what happened? Yeah, I mean, it's semi auto. Fine, I, I nailed all my shots on that. Full auto, I'm like, what happened on that? I thought I, that felt better than what it looks for performance. Yeah, and even semi-auto, it feels like it opened up a little bit more than I expected. I feel very confident when I'm behind the trigger of this gun, and then I go look at the target. I, I got no explanation for that. And even, the weirder part, the weirder part was that I looked at the target comparing full auto, like in, in post. Like we, on range day, we got to take some time in between shots and stuff like that. So I couldn't quite remember how my full auto looked when I, after I did the squat. So when I looked at my comparison photos between the full auto, just prone, prone, full auto squat, I was like, they look almost the same, except one's got a little more dirt on it. <laughs> yeah, you had a couple of zingers down in the dirt Yeah. when you were squatted because it's so hard to kind of know where to put yourself. And that was, I would argue, the most uncontrollable seated position that we had with this gun. Yeah, how did that feel? Uh, weird. Yeah. I, I, I felt like a turtle, honestly, because I had to be hunched up and down. And the problem was, was that, and we talked about this before, we really didn't have a terrain set up for it because being flat and how far out these legs do protrude when they're fully extended, it's not enough to really sit for a person of my height and be comfortable and shoot it. Because I honest, even at that, we had it in sandbags. So we actually had it down into sandbags to give it even a little extra height. And that wasn't even necessarily for height. That was what we thought would be helpful just in terms of sinking it better. No, it's still like, it, it just didn't, it still wasn't right for me. So who's shooting this? What short person's Indian style shooting that? <laughs> There's something weird with this gun. And I don't have the time to get into, because here's the thing, there's the history, and then there's the utility. And we're not necessarily utility shooters, we're just demonstrating for you guys. But after Project Lightning, and after handling it for this, I want to say there's something to the sort of uh, recoil concerns with this gun. Because of the dispersal, because of the fact that I think it wants to sort of bob and jump. And then the fact that I've never had a gun that I felt so good behind the trigger and then saw a mediocre hit on paper. Like, if you were to never look at your targets and check all the light machine guns we've handled, you would put this right up against the Lewis gun. Well, if you think about it, that's where we were putting it, too. We really, for feel, like, and we kept being surprised at performance and stuff like that, but for feel, we kept putting it right up there at the yeah. top. And no, it's not the barrel on this one. We've sat down and checked it a little bit better than that. We had at least that much time to sort of fiddle with it. Mm -mm. It's just the way the recoil is on these guns. Yeah. And when you run them semi-auto, the sights are a little unclean. You get a little walk on them because you're kind of handling the gun. And it's getting a little upset, but they're reasonable in semi-auto. Yeah. So how do you feel about something like this in the context of the Great War? You've handled other light machine guns. This is the oldest light machine gun that would be available in the Great War because it, it's the oldest light machine gun it's in terms of actually that. being developed. Yeah, I mean, this thing predates the other guys by a good bit. That's so weird to think about it. It just, uh, it, uh, yeah, bizarre. Yeah, so how comfortable are you with this versus say one of the other guns? Yeah, um, so comparing it to other guns, there, this one has, gives, it gives me a few concerns. There, there are two major concerns I would say that I have on this gun. I feel like this one would be pretty susceptible to mud and muck because we got all this, this openness here in this, in this shroud of this barrel. I feel like, and then it's got like the ejection port open at the bottom where mud lives. Thank you. That's the ground. The, earth. They've gone to the extra effort of covering it up. So you can seal that. Right. But then are you planning on shooting it and not letting any casings go out the bottom? You know, the bigger thing for me is just how much of this gun's externalized. I've got, yes. I've got very important bits. That was my second point yeah. was that you got all these bits sticking out the side that honestly, 
they're little tabs and they're handles. And I'm just looking at it being like, this is just an accident waiting to happen. You drop it once, you've got something bent. I just don't see it working if it gets bent or danged up in the wrong way. To be fair, some of that may also have been that we've been in and out of this gun a bunch of times trying to get these little bent up bits to be the way they should be. So we've seen one that's taken oh that God. kind of wear. Yes. And I kind of agree. There's some there's some hesitation in terms of how truly long lived this gun could be. And then especially with the magazine sticking how, the, look, we've already had the issues with the mags themselves too because they're so flimsy and susceptible to dings and dangs. And I'm sorry, but that one ding in that mag and you will not be able to fill that thing up all the way. We have had that issue on range. This is the heart of my problem right here. The magazines? Yes, and they would reinforce these in later versions of the gun, but not in time for the Great War. Uh, if you look at, say, like the Brazilian ones from the 50s, the Portuguese ones from the 50s or whatever, mm -hmm. they have massive reinforcement on these because they knew that was a problem, and I've heard that people have no issues with them, but these have little tiny tabs. Right. And they just get bent and broken, and it's just, Granted, and it's not like you are, we weren't hard on these guns. We were very delicate, but just over time, they slowly beat themselves to death. However, these these mags have been around for 100 years. Yes, this is true. They so have the time, had 100 years worth of wear. If, if these were fresh, you'd feel pretty good. If they were fresh, I probably wouldn't be as concerned about the feeding issues that we had. Right. I probably wouldn't, but I, I still think it would be a concern out the gate where I'd be like, this Mac doesn't look like it's very rigid. Like, is this gonna be okay if I accidentally drop it on a rock? Yeah. Now I still have that concern. Once we made the necessary repairs to this gun, it was not likely to jam ever at all. Right, this is true. Once it was running, it was running. That, it did jam. Right. And jams are gonna happen on the battlefield. Any machine gun we have learned <laughs> will jam. And successfully clearing jams on this one, it's just a bit of a tricky business because you can't really, you can't really easily access the inside without taking the gun apart effectively. This is also the only gun I've known that repeatedly jams when you try to clear a live cartridge with no following cartridges. Right, it's the only one I would argue might be technically worse is the Lewis gun with a double feed which is a nightmare and a half in and Yeah, Lewis going with double feed, I've still never found an adequate solution for that other than just the most horrible sort of manipulation. But this gun, the OAL for the seven millimeter cartridge, which again is why I'm curious about how the Germans converted these things because the OAL on the seven mil is so tight in this mm -hmm. 1905 that if you have a Spitzer bullet seven mil and you go to crank extract that thing, you better whip it. Because if you don't whip the action and get everything all the way to the rear plus some momentum, then it's gonna soft that cartridge out and it's gonna stick. And you're in for halfway taking this gun apart just to get the live cartridge out of the ejection port. Right. Like it ties up in there so easily. And then on the feed, it has this weird feed mechanism that was then abandoned for later models for obvious reasons. Uh, this sort of like slicer feed that it's got going on. Again, if it starts to feed a cartridge wrong, it'll tie up and then to get it out, you can't just get in there with a pocket knife and crank. You have to take the gun apart, not lift the lid. You have to take it into two pieces. Yep. Every time and half pull the action out. You've had to do that a few times on range yeah. and it is a nightmare and a half. It's not, well, I mean, it's not a nightmare and a half. It's just not just good. Just a nightmare? <laughs> well, it's not good. It's not good. Okay. It's like, we didn't like the Lewis gun uh, for clearing jams because it was a pain, but it was so rare to happen, and yet this happened more to us, so it made us more nervous about it. True. So all that covered, would you say that you'd take this behind certain rifles? I can't, I can't really see myself taking a rifle over this. Even out of some of the best rifles with some of the best performances we've had with them, I, you know, if I've got a support team that I've got with this guy, absolutely I'd be comfortable taking it, but just, uh, there's no rifle that really beats it out, you know? In terms of universal use. Right. Uh, certain context, yes, there's some like carbines yeah, okay. that we like. But Everything's all about context, I agree, but in most situations, overall. in most situations I would agree is an overall feeling. No, I can't see a rifle I would take over this. Okay, what about in terms of light machine gun comparisons? Where does this fit in that hierarchy? Is this, would you consider this a serviceable, war-ready light machine gun? I can't see it not being because, I mean, we, we've shot a lot of them so far for the series and uh, we've certainly handled some worse machine guns. I mean, the Hotchkiss Portative, which smaller than this gun, yet um, was insanely heavy by comparison. The OE-15, which is awkward with a weird, like with the whole water jacket and everything else, that was terrible. This one, on the other hand, nice air cool. It's it's not the, the Lewis gun in terms of performance, but it certainly didn't do bad. It's kind of interesting, this being the, the first of the light machine guns in a lot of ways. 
Yeah. And yet the lessons didn't seem to carry over. A lot of the problems we had with other mechanisms were things that were already flushed out on this one. Just executed weirdly because of the way the mechanism works. Mm -hmm. But the gun itself, take away the mechanism and all its weird, you know, behavior. The rest of the gun set up very nicely as a light oh, machine. Yeah, gun. it's so, actually not bad. They put some thought into that. Yeah, the barrel, the barreled action, like the barrel and that whole breech block are one piece that come right out, and you can keep spares, and mm -hmm. they did. So if you have a couple spares of those, even the stuff I we're worried like about. I did like you talked about that. Yeah, in the episode, how yeah. you could just do a hot swap right there. I yeah. kind of like that. That's a good idea. And not only that, but the hot swap's hardly necessary if you're using it like it's designed to be, which is a recoil rifle. And it has burst in case somebody gets right up on you. But realistically, you're supposed to take 25 rounds and then just boom, 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 boom. You know. I'm trying to remember. I think it took about... If I remember correctly, six mags out of this guy of consistent firing for about a uh, total, maybe 45 minutes for it got, when it got hot. Right. That was, if I recall, that's how long it took it effect. It, it don't quote me on that to perf, you know, exact, but that's pretty dang what it was for it to get too hot to really touch. Right. I don't know. I still need a judgment from you. Where would you, is it better than a Shosha? Yes. Is it better than a Lewis gun? In terms of performance, technically no. Okay. Uh, it is lighter than the Lewis it gun. It is lighter than the Lewis gun. Okay. So, 0815? No. Well, no 0815, I've got a massive capacity of mag of Well, no, technically. So no. this 15 is... technically might beat this one, technically, just because of the amount of rounds that I've got. So right. are we thinking Once you're set up with the 0815, you're set up with the 0815. Yeah, and I've got a team with me on that one. Like, it's not. It's definitely not just me. Granted, I'm supposed to have a team with this one. But yeah, with a team just swapping me out um, like big drums one after another, yeah, the 0815 would technically beat this out. There's also, when we talk about specific to World War I tactics, there's this element of pressure a machine gun with a light machine gun and the idea is to have suppressive fire uh, or very heavily targeted direct fire on the machine gun emplacement from your light machine gun I don't know that the Madsen quite had the fire rate reliably to do that role and you didn't see anybody using it that way right it, I, don't there, I have no reports everybody talks about them being used for assault but I couldn't find anything that actually backed that up for I saw them being used as defense for assault sure I could see that for second line defense I could see it for suppressive fire at the front I could not see that well that's what its assault role would be everybody thinks of a light machine gun on an assault role as being like jump into the trench turn left turn right and mm -hmm. on that you could actually get away with that oh with this you gun. could yeah but really what they used them for was you send that up with a couple grenade guys and that suppresses that position so it stays still long enough to lob the grenades in there it's a quick suppress. I mean, you've only got 25 rounds, so I guess you better make your shots count. Yeah, you the, the, the show shot's only 20 rounds, so it also suffers that issue. But even as wild as the show shot was in terms of its recoil and everything, I have some fears. With that magazine. So I would put this in probably slightly better than show shot all across the board. Mm-hmm. And maybe even way more better if I could get my hands on a minty one from back in the day. Would you agree with something like that? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably agree with that consensus, too. I can see what you're talking about. It's the same concerns we've had before. Susceptible to mud and muck. Any dings or dangs on that thing, and it's probably going to need some service. Okay, uh, let's go with the final controversial question, then. Oh, Do you think Germany was correct to not invest in more of these and instead push the 0815 project? I personally agree with that consensus, simply because... Uh, the OA-15 is just a more universal machine gun. It it ha it does better for like a, the amount of rounds that it can hammer out. It can go for longer periods of time. You've got a full team with you to kind of restock you. You can go pretty long with that gun as opposed to this one. you got to be swapping mags every 25 rounds. That's not going to be good. It was also easier for them to make versus trying to set up a whole production line for these. Exactly. You could churn and burn those out compared to this one. I would actually like to see a, a comparison time on that for how long it would take to make an 0815 versus one of these. So I think this is one of those times where our assessment of the gun actually matches what happened in history. Uh, it feels like this is a perfectly acceptable, if not kind of exceptional, uh, make do light machine gun. Oh crap, I need a light machine gun and I have <laughs> none. Luckily, I'll go to the light machine gun Kmart and this is on the sale rack. Oh man, that's for sale? I mean, it does what it needs to do. 
However, I can see logistics and support for it being a nightmare. Yes. Unless you had already been built specifically to do these before the war. And then I also see some disadvantages compared to some of the other systems that we see really emerging during the war. But that's okay to me because this, again, I cannot overstress. This basic action dates back to 1888 as a rifle. Which is incredible to me. And then it went back and forth as a rifle and a light machine gunny thing before settling into this pattern really only by 1903. Yep. Which again was 1903. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very impressive. And the interesting thing is they went and improved it from here. There Which are, is great. Yeah, the 1903, what, 14? Well, so when people talk about the Madsen, they mo no, no, not just the 14, because the 14 is really just a 1903 with some stuff on it. Mm -hmm. the, the, I'm talking about into the 50s, this was being oh, improved. Oh, yeah, it was still being used. They made, so right, when this one was made, it was much more of a, these were done per contract. So mm -hmm. it was it was tailored to the cartridge, it was tailored to whoever ordered it. They later came out with a more universal receiver that you could mix and match to get what cartridge you want. And Which they, is awesome. Everything was buffed up. The, the interrupter was perfected, all this other stuff. And that's the Madsen most people think of, and it's the one most people have seen. I want to shoot that. Like, even when you look at photos online, you just Google Madsen. You're going to get pictures of those later ones. It's very important to remember how early this gun. This is a 1905 pattern. That's crazy. A decade before the war. So then look at something like the Portative, which was being worked on right up to the war, and the Lewis gun that came out right at the beginning, of the war, like uh -huh. right there at the skirt. So this thing got pretty far pretty early. Mm -hmm. And then it never quite caught on. It was almost like, this is like early adopter technology. This is version 1.0. There's going to be bugs. So I'm really impressed. I, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hecka impressed. They did a fantastic job for making something that was then used in a way that they weren't truly anticipating. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was... In terms of trying to predict the future, this was a very good job. Right. I would uh, agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess it gets a soft yes in the light machine gun taken in the battle. Yes, it does get a soft yes just because it, we do have ones that I've done better. We certainly have had ones that I've done worse, but it it, def it did the job. I think uh, I would feel confident enough taking it into battle. Just I, I have my concerns, which put it into the softer of the categories of yeses. That's true. I'd probably give it a medium. Yeah. Medium, yes. You're not soft served. You're more of a more of a hard, not hard boiled, but you're more of a soft boiled. I've, I'm not sure. It, <laughs> the, again, there's so many unknowns. However, I have to give it a badge. I'm going to give it a medium, yes. Okay. I'm very impressed. Uh, I think it would. I don't think there'd be any difference between this and 7.92. We shot this one in seven millimeter. Yeah, I don't. It's going to depend on what army you're in as to what cartridge it feeds. Um, I have not shot it rimmed, but I've heard they function very well with rimmed, which is also a miracle. Uh, right? Considering that it's not belt or Didn't sort of... Didn't have the extremely curved magazines too? Well, you have to have an extremely controlled feed for rimmed, and this thing could run rimmed. Now, I haven't done that, but the fact that it can do that is also very impressive and should not be forgotten specifically to the Russian use. So, there's probably even more we could talk about this, but I think we just need to call it, say that it's, you know, a decent light machine gun. Incredibly impressive to get that badge from being as early as it was. Yes, I agree. Okay. Um, any final thoughts on the Madsen? Uh, I will be sad to see this home. Thank you again, Klaus, for letting us use it for as long as we did. We greatly appreciated it. If you were to personally own a gun like this, not for warfare, is there anything else that would concern you, by the way? Uh, for me personally owning it? Uh, what? You're, you're going somewhere specific with this. Where yeah. are you going? Don't you, you remember always... the big headache on the range with this thing? Um, you cannot see the loaded chamber. We talked about it for a second. Right, earlier. yeah. So whenever it was time to say, is the Madsen clear or not? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, just having to check it to make sure it was clear. I would agree. That is... Klaus, thank you for loaning us this gun. Keep a very powerful flashlight handy. Yeah. Because you have to open the cover you and You've got to look for that shiny brass. You've yeah. got to look for it. You've got to... Look for it when you're not looking for it. And by the way, you can rack it open, and it'll only lock open if there's nothing in the chamber. However, it'll keep one in the hopper almost half the time. Yeah, it'll just and retain them in there. Then if that thing drops and it happens to pick that thing up just right, like it, it is scary to try to figure out whether or not this gun is loaded or not. This is, this is a tricky gun to know whether or not it's hot. It needs yeah. a chamber indicator or something on it. I would agree. What? Which is something. I'll, I'll take an extra thing sticking off the side. You know, I yeah. will. So if you got a buddy with a Madsen and he's not really good at carrying the one, don't go downrange that thing ever. 
Nope. No trust. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good one. <laughs> Night, guys. All right, gang, uh, number one, if you recognized us at the show show this past weekend, awesome. Glad to have met you. Thanks for saying hi. We really appreciate all of you. Uh, number two, if you are a patron, uh, a lot of you guys are not necessarily checking out the podcasts every time. I know that it's because you don't always check Patreon or Subscribestar or whatever you're signed up for. Do try to later this week. Uh, the new topic, I think, is going to be particularly interesting because we ended up in a lot of discussions about the nature of sort of like the older collector community versus the new, sort of the, the quote-unquote death of the gun show, uh, the sort of collapse of the Winchester and Colt markets. Uh, this is something that I think is very interesting to a lot of people. So if you want to hear that, again, that's any and all patron and subscribe star members. Even if you're down at the dollar level, everybody gets to hear those podcasts. So come on over and check them out. All right, have a good one.